and we are very proud of what we have to offer. Uh, without further ado, I'd like to introduce our speakers today. Ah, these Seif, Seif, Seif. I'm so sorry. That's right. the, the the enduring issue with only reading things and never hearing them aloud. <laughs> Abby is an award-winning journalist with 10 years of experience in reporting and editing in Asia's, Asia Pacific and the U.S. extensive experience writing and editing news features, investigations, and reports for the public and private sector. The writing and photography has have been published in numerous leading international publications, including Newsweek, Time Magazine, The Economist, The Associated Press, The Guardian, The New York Times, Al Jazeera, and many more. Her probe of the Global Fund Program in Cambodia won honorable mention for investigative reporting in the 2013 SOPA Awards. Elizabeth Becker began her career as a war correspondent for the Washington Post in Cambodia. She has been the senior cor senior for oh my God, doing this, so I'm so sorry. The senior foreign editor for the National Public Radio and the New York Times correspondent covering national security, economics, and foreign policy. She has won accolades from the Overseas Press Club, DuPont Columbia's awards, and was part of was part of the Times team that won the Pulitzer Prize for public service for coverage of 9-11. She is the author of When the War Was Over, Cambodia and the Khmer Rouge Revolution, the classic history that has been in print for 35 years and overbooked the exploding business of travel and tourism, an expose of the travel industry that was an Amazon book of the year. Thank you for listening to me. Uh, without further ado, welcome to, to both of you. We're in conversation. Um, we, I admit we both have a horrible bias in favor of Cambodia, um, which is I think an infection we got, we got there, honestly. Um, but I wanna first start off asking Abing, Abby, excuse me. <laughs> what was sort of the general picture of the book? Cause I don't, I presume everybody's gonna buy it, but they haven't read it yet. You know, the main theme, and um, sort of what's driving it, the tension and, and you know, why you wrote the book essentially. Thank you, Elizabeth, and thank you all for coming tonight. This means a lot to me. Um, yeah, so this book looks at the Tonle Sap Lake, which I think probably most people here have a, a fairly good understanding of it. Um, but just for a brief overview, this is, this is uh, a lake in Cambodia but it is also the biggest fishery in Southeast Asia. It's the biggest freshwater lake in um, the whole region. Um, and it's a body of water that millions rely on for their livelihood. Um, apart from that, it's, it's really biodiverse. It's um, very important for the agriculture surrounding it for a reason I'll explain in a moment. And um, it is, uh, it's something that millions of people depend on. It's also, uh, it's also really important culturally. So the lake is kind of what permitted the kingdom of Angkor to grow. It's, it's like a key, it's, it's a key part of Cambodian culture. Um, you know, a lot of there's songs about the lake. It's just, it's just, it's a major, uh, it's everything. Um, and the lake is being beset by a slew of problems right now. So um, just as a brief sort of geographical overview, it's fed by the Mekong River, um, by this reversing, this Tonle Sap River, which reverses course. And uh, this river, because it reverses course twice a year, it's the only river in the world to do so. Um, it fills the lake. I don't know where to look. <laughs> it feels like it's sort of like a beating heart motion twice a year. Um, and the lake turns into this prodigious floodplain. It expands six times its size. It's really extraordinary phenomenon. Um, and unfortunately, because of climate change and because of hydropower dams, that pulse that opens and closes the lake is being cut off. Um, then there's a third problem, which is overfishing, and that's cutting off an already diminishing supply of fish, and that's really impacting the people who are living on this lake. 
what among the many things I liked about your book was how you drew that picture and you talked about the miracle when it goes back and forth and that's you know part of the cultural myth but then you were in, in you know in very clear ways dams in China <laughs> climate change illegal fishing yeah I mean to me it's really a, a perfect storm it's um I think often we focus on one of these elements at the, at the detriment of the others. Um, so hydropower is a huge issue. Um, you know, China, the, the Mekong runs from China all the way down through Cambodia and Vietnam. And in China, you've got these perfect conditions for hydro damming. Um, in the lower Mekong, it's a much more, it's kind of a slow moving river that is great as a fishery and it's great for rice paddies and that sort of things but upstream it's it's just extraordinary for damming and china has taken advantage of that they've got 11 dams on the main stem of the lansing and as a result um that's really changing the downstream hydrology and so that's changing how much water yeah. comes downstream in the, the wet season and the dry season um, but that's definitely not the only problem. You know, climate change has been horrific in Cambodia. There's just been uh, there's been a real number of droughts in recent years, um, and it's not just droughts. There's also been worsening floods. When you know the rainy season does come, the flooding is much worse. Um, and so you have these. You know, those two are really changing how the water levels are dropping drastically. The third thing is. Um, I mean, climate change is, all of those are man-made. The third thing, I think of them as sort of global, regional and local, and the third is very local and that's overfishing and illegal fishing. Um, and some of that, a big part of that is from small fishers because they're really desperate. They can't catch the way they used to. So they're kind of being forced to a more desperate situation and they're uh, using illegal methods, but there's also, it's pretty clear that there's large scale illegal fishing going on um, and that is happening with the collusion of local authorities. Um, and so this has just created this perfect storm where in a really short period of time, we're talking a couple of decades tops, we're just seeing fishing numbers plummeting. Um, and a lot of this is anecdotal, you know, it's fishermen talking about their catch year to year, mm -hmm. um, but it's, it's really evident. Like you can go to some areas on the lake and they're, they, they're huge houses, you know, they used to be, this used to be a way to really make a living and support your family. And now they're catching nothing. Their kids are going off to migrate. Um, it's completely changing their way of life. Yeah, you called, I remember one, the village you called Bucolic um, Island Nestle in Hong mm -hmm. Kong. And, and you can see how beautiful it was and how it's being drained. <clears throat> and so the obvious question now is, okay, it's, if it's a couple of decades, What's the government been doing to help these people? Are, is the government a help or a hindrance? So we know the answer because it's been said, but go ahead. Uh, <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, I don't know. I, I do think it's complicated. Um, I would also say like, you know, it's not, I don't want to overly idealize what it's like to be a fisherman even 30 or 40 years ago. This is not ever, uh, you know, it was never easy and it was never like the ideal way to make a, a, a living. But the point was like, you could support yourself and your family and you can't do that anymore. Um, in terms of what the government is doing, you know, I, th I think many of us are familiar with Cambodia, like Cambodia has amazing laws on the books. Um, Cambodia is a great country for laws. And so the, there's a whole protected biosphere around Tom Lysap. It's, you know, on paper, it's in it's in everything you would want. Um, in practice, there's just no enforcement, and it's exactly the same what we see in you know protected forest areas. So there was a really interesting investigation recently, I think from VOD, where they looked at the flooded forest around the Tonga South, which is supposed to be all protected land, um, and it's just been raised to make way for farming. I mean, deforestation complete okay. deforestation um and then these farms are rented out to farmers uh and now there's a huge you know the government recognizes this there's a, a big crackdown there's always a big crackdown and so like the crackdown is um kicking all these farmers who are tenant farmers off this land you know these are people who sort of 
paid their last pennies to rent this farm. And the, the guys who, who procured this land, local officials, not much was being done with them. Um, it's also, this has been happening for four or five years. You know, at this point, it's like all the forest is gone. What can we do now? Um, and it's similar with the lake. Like every so often there are these big crackdowns. There's a big effort to go after illegal fishing. The officials show up with their thousands of miles of nets and burn them ceremoniously. And, you know, um, and I don't want to say that's, you know, those are important, but the, is it just a photo op or is there really? Sure. Yeah. And window dressing. Yeah. And f from the fisherman's standpoint, it's, it's, it's window dressing. You know, they say there is not enforcement. And these are, this is what the small fishermen talk about all the time, that there isn't Speaking any of enforcement. Hi, Douglas. <laughs> what about um, and one of the ways that you really brought it home to me, and I have to, I mean, what I loved was that um, we all have read about the climate crisis and so on and so forth, but it's so important to live it, and you made me live it. And so uh, that was really wonderful. And one of the best parts for me was Prahok. Because yeah, anybody who knows Cambodia Prahok. And, you know, somehow you had me in the Tony's app and it's drought and all that sort of stuff. And then you, you brought it to Prahok. How can you look at that Prahok? Yeah, and you can't talk about the Tony's app. You can't talk about fisheries in Cambodia or in Thailand or in Laos without talking about Prahok. And for people who don't know, this is a fermented fish paste. It's all the countries in the region have their own variety. Um, and it's made out of these really tiny fish, which are like very, uh, in Cambodia it's tray wheel, but it's a type of um, cyprianate. And they're like these small oily fish. Um, I guess anchovies might be a type. Really, really, really nutritious, um, very important for the diet. Um, so it's not just, it's not just like a seasoning that people like, it's a really, it's a critical food source. Um, and, you know, th there's kind of this sense that like we, we can never, we'll never lo lose this fish because it's there's so much of it. And during the season when when they're catching these fish, it's just it's like thousands of tons speeding through the water and getting caught in these bad nets. Um, but even you know, even these, there's kind of reported drops in the catch every year, and the price of hawk is going up, and that has real effects for again it's the poorest people who suffer from this. And, and to bring it home to what um, a lot of us foreigners who have lived there and, and know it, um, so a lot go and a lot of foreigners go and think they're helping in modernization and development. And that's the other blast you had. I think it's on page 57. Oh, my, my, <laughs> huh? my, my thing against the NGOs. Well, no, it's <laughs> but, um, uh, that whether it's a government program, a UN program, a charity program, but you have the cost mm. on 57, and I didn't, I left my book at home, of, um, on the, uh, the, the cost of the, yeah. the could, you, could you just read that? Sure. This is, the, the dams were supposed yeah. to do this, and then they, all this was supposed to lead to modernization, yeah. and instead. Yeah, so the thing to understand about the dams is, um, you know, we tend to just talk about the dams as uh, it's this catastrophic impact, but like dams were created to bring energy, clean energy to these countries. Um, and, you know, a lot of people have long said that the trade-offs are just not worth it. Um, but the countries like, you know, they need to power their factories and they need to like bring development and yeah, we can get more into that. But um, they did, the Mekong River Commission did modeling a few years ago, really elaborate modeling when they looked at the cost benefits um, to all the countries. Um, and I will just read this um, paragraph. Recent modeling by the MRC has shown precisely the ways in which food security will rise, flood damage will worsen, and the effects of poverty will remain. The decline of fisheries could cost the region nearly 23 billion by 2040. The loss of forests, wetlands, and mangroves may cost up to 145 billion. With more than 90% of sedimentation blocked, rice growth along the Mekong will be severely affected. Fish farms, irrigation, and agricultural could help offset these losses, but with uneven results between classes and countries. Because it is so far downstream and lacks the economic cushion and strong governance of Vietnam, 
Cambodia will suffer, suffer these impacts more than any other Mekong nation. And then the report says, Cambodia is likely to experience from a national perspective, the highest trade-off for every dollar gained from hydropower, about 62 cents would be lost in fisheries. Hunger will rise and stability will grow. Poverty will increase, not shrink. Choking places. Yeah. Choking places. Yeah. Um, and then, I, you know, the, the other thing you did nicely, and I, I never had, it's so hard to, to pull everything together, just how with, so the dams, the water's not being brought down. Mm -hmm. One hopes China opens up its eyes and is more generous. So the water's not bringing down. So climate crisis, heating up, mm -hmm. droughts get worse. Mm -hmm. And this not only hurts Tony Saab, the fisheries, but then the rice. It's, mm -hmm. So the rice and fish, the two things that we mm -hmm. think of. And um, and you packed all that into this one story about a lake. Yeah, I mean, this is the thing. It's like the lake is a stand-in for everything else because this lake really is life. and. It's around the lakes that the rice is growing. It's in the lake that the fish is coming from. Um, and then, you know, culturally, like the, the water festival is because the lake is expanding and contracting. And it's just, it is a lake, but it's a lot more than a lake. And it's, how, how big is it? How, how large is it? What would you compare it to here? Um, I think I said when it, I, I have a section in the beginning where I, I looked up all these comparisons. Um, it's, it's, it's sort of small compared to most of our big lakes, um, but it's one of the most prodigious in fish. And then um, in the rainy season, the surface area can reach 6,000 square miles, which is about the size of Fiji. So it's not, it's, yeah. So if you don't care about Cambodia, <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, what would you tell people? Why would you tell people to read this book? I think of this, I told I'm supposed to hold it up. Um, <laughs> I think of this as a, a metonym for what's happening around the world. Like this is, this is not unique to Cambodia. Um, we're all, you know, we're in a wealthy nation, in a wealthy part of a wealthy nation. Um, so maybe we are not seeing this stuff firsthand, but we're certainly experiencing the impacts of climate change, we're certainly experiencing the impacts of, you know, government decisions that are not done in the name of the people. Um, and I, I don't think that's at all unique to Cambodia. Um, you know, I, to me, I, we need to kind of be aware of this stuff. And, mm -hmm. and I, I think most of us are, but I think, you know, I like to hope that like, the more informed we are, the more, I don't know what I would say, raise our voices. I, I, it's well, so, it, some of it's really beyond us, but not all of it is. Mm -hmm. I, 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 I always choose optimism, but, but realism. But um, you know, what I liked about it is I thought it could land, land in, a, in a bookstore. I put it either, I'd be, is this environmental section mm. or in the Asia section. I mean, is that good on, on climate change and mm. everything? Um, and, and just that there's, there, you can't have too many books, I don't think, on environmental change. No, and I, I think, you know, we're people, maybe we don't want to read about it, but we, we do want to read about it because mm. it's, this is our world. This is what we're living in. And, you know, we kind of better damn well be prepared. Um, I'll have to add that the other thing I thought of, and um, you didn't put a big spotlight on this, was that um, Tony Thop is right next to CM Rep, as we all know mm -hmm. in Angkor. Big tourist spot. Huge. Yeah. Huge for yeah. Pretty soon it's going to be a muddy lake that no tourists want to come to. I mean, <laughs> I don't think it's quite that extreme. I mean, I, I when I say the lake is dying, I don't, it's not the RLC, it's not going to disappear, but. Um, but it's true, for instance, like a, a popular tourist thing is go and see the floating villages mm -hmm. and uh, very hard to do that when the water isn't rising properly. And, and the um, people are not so festive. No. And that they're, they're not having such a... Yeah. Right. Yeah. So was there something you wanted to read, an excerpt from the book? Um, yeah, I, yeah, I do want to read an excerpt. I was going to read about 
I was going to read from the start, which kind of gives an overview, but I think we talked about that a little bit. So I, I'm going to read from the end. It's going to be a bit of a spoiler. Um, <laughs> so this is kind of uh, most of, I didn't really talk about this, but most of the reporting I did for this was in 2016 when there was a really, really bad drought. And then in 2017 and 2018, I went back a few times. Um, and then I came back and wanted to write the book. And then we, I had an idea of how I would do it. And I thought I would go back to Cambodia and um, because of the pandemic, I couldn't. Um, and so the book is, it's a little different from what I wanted it to be. Um, and it's very much relying on this like concrete body of reporting I had. Um, but I also wanted to talk about what was happening subsequent to that. Um, so this, this sort of catches us up until today. Um, slowly and then very fast, the seasons stop working. In 2018, there's too much rain and too much water. In July, a dam collapses in Lao, sending its reservoir pouring across the countryside. Whole villages are swept away and scores are killed. The water rushes down the Sekong River across the Cambodian border. Thousands hurry to relocate as the river spills its bank, flooding 17 villages, destroying homes and crops. Already the Sekong, Cezanne, and Sirkop, the Mekong and Tonle Sap had been too full. A tropical storm had sent their levels rising, and all of the lower Mekong was struggling with the floods. A year later, it's gone bone dry. A drought sweeps the region. In 2019, almost one year to the day after the dams collapse, the level of the Mekong dips to a record low. An entire dam reservoir in Thailand dries up, revealing the remains of a temple drowned decades earlier. In Lao, less than half the land can be planted on. The Mekong slows to a drip, and so there is no fresh water to push out the salt spilling into Vietnam's delta, destroying crops by the ton. The Tonle Sap gets one good fishing year, 2018, and then no more. In 2019, the river reversed his course months late, and that lasts just six weeks instead of the usual five months. When the lake reaches its maximum volume, it is half the average. In 2020, until a series of brutal flash floods arrive in October, the river never quite reverses course. For nearly the whole wet season, the height of the Tonle Sap stays too low to push any significant amount of water upstream. The volume of the lake reaches just a quarter of its average. Once again, fishers say the same thing. We've never seen it like this. We've never experienced a water level so low. Every year, it seems, there's a new awful superlative to apply to the lake. Recovery mechanisms have failed completely. In 2017, the fishing came back after the drought year. Debts could be repaid, stocks replenished. In 2020, a fisher might spend an entire day pulling nets and coming up with this, a few eels, two snakes. The desperation is growing palpable. Set at the end of rainy season, the water festival is a glorious affair. Each November, as the water begins flooding out again from the Tonle Sap, a million Cambodians pack into minivans and buses and head for the capital. This water festival, in some iteration or another, is perhaps 800 years old. What began as a commemoration of Jayavarman VII's crushing naval defeat at the Chams morphed over time into a Thanksgiving of sorts, a celebration of the river's reversal, the fertile pulse. The nights are for partying, the days are for racing. Spectators throng the waterfront to watch long dragon boats manned by dozens. Two by two, the boats chase down the Tonlesap River. By then, the water has become dangerous, deep and swift. Branches and tangles of hyacinth unmoored by the swelling river rush alongside the paddlers. Most years, boats overturn. On occasion, racers drown. In 2009, I interviewed a number of captains. Their biggest concern to a man was the height of the water. They were fishers. They knew how to swim, each assured me. But did I know how they might get life jackets? We want a race to keep our traditions alive. It makes us happy, Rower told me, by way of explaining why he took the risk year after year. Just a decade later, as their oars rip through the water for the 2019 Water Festival, racers find themselves speeding on a river that has reached a historic low. At the bottom of the concrete quay where the crowds gather, a patch of browning grass stretches out toward this shallow water. The Tonle Sap, lapping at its edges, barely appears to be moving. In 2020, the races are canceled because of COVID-19. Too dangerous to travel, to pack the riverfront, too much poverty streaming across the country. Then too, the river never really reverses course. What could there be to celebrate? 
That's sad. Yeah. <laughs> it's beautifully written for this person. Yeah, very sad. Um, and I have to bring up the government again. Yeah. Um, you, 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 you piqued my interest, so I looked up stuff, what's going mm -hmm. on. It, and there's a good USA USAID program mm -hmm. called The Wonder of Make On. Yeah. yeah. Do you want to explain? I mean, it's, yeah. give us a little up. Yeah, so this is, no, 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 that, I would say it's on hopeless, and I'll yeah, okay, go ahead. tell you the okay. reasons why. Um, yes, this is an interesting program. They're um, introducing a whole bunch of fish back into the Mekong, like really endangered giant Mekong catfish and giant barb and these like critically endangered special species. Um, and they've been raising them for years and they're releasing them back in. Um, and I asked the researcher, I said I was, I, I emailed with him a few weeks ago who sent me the press release and I said, oh, wow, this is nice to see because people ask if there's any hope and, you know, um, and I said, I, I'm a little surprised because my understanding was, you know, with the way the river was, you know, this would impact migration. They would, and he said, no, no, we, we think, you know, we think there's a real chance for them to thrive and, and grow and repopulate. In the lake so yeah so that's usaid with um an american university it's some nevada right yeah, yeah. And, and then and then working with the fisheries department mm -hmm. in, in cambodia mm -hmm. is there anything that, um good that the government's doing um i mean we know mm -hmm. the greedy corruption I don't know. It's, fair. it's. I will say, like, I'm not on the ground there. I haven't been there for no, a few but just years. So. Your, no, 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 no. But in the, um, in the two decades. Come on. No. Uh, is there anything good? I mean, it's very complicated. So, for instance, you know, there were these fishing lots. Um, the fishing lots were the system um, where wealthy people could basically own a portion of the lake and grow their mm. fish in there and they had the right to whatever fish and this was lucrative you know they would spend hundreds of thousands of dollars for the right to these lots and they were kind of run by um they would have these local militias i mean it got really violent to keep out the local fishers um and from everything i've read it was just like this anarchic situation um it sort of kept the fish stocks thriving because it was somewhat privatized, but it was really not good for small fishers. And so Hansen would cancel these lots every so often, um, which was probably a good thing. And some of them were turned into community fisheries, which are, is a very good thing. Mm -hmm. um, and then in 2013, they were completely annulled. Um, and a lot of researchers thought this would be really good for the for the lake and for the stocks, but again, because there just was not the type of enforcement to protect the protected areas in particular, mm -hmm. it's, it just led to a big depletion. So I think that's kind of what we see over and over again. We, we see, you know, a government effort that's in good faith, but it's just not fully implemented, or we see um, a good government effort, but it just comes far too late. Uh, like Elizabeth kindly printed out an article from the Post published no, post. this today. week. Today. Um, oh, today. Yeah. Um, yeah, about uh, a new crackdown from Prime Minister Hansen. Uh, draw up a map of the crime hotspots on the Tomislav Lake for us to investigate. There will be a Telegram chat group where these things can be shared. Um, you know, these these things are good, but my my suspicion yeah. is that this is going to be going after small guys. It's, mm -hmm. All these problems ultimately come down to corruption and to big players and to people who are really benefiting from mm -hmm. resource extraction. Mm -hmm. um, and until that's dealt with, like, I don't know. But but I will say, unlike a lot of the protected forests, the Tongue Sap is you know, the, the pride of the nation. And so I, I do think it's, you know, the government is much more likely to maybe belatedly, but um, recognize that and, and want to do things. You also have, um, you thought that it might be possible that China would be more generous with the water, more intelligent. Yeah, that's my understanding um, that 
you know, MRC recently came out with this report where they were looking at what happens if uh, sort of sort of how much of the reservoir water that's being held back is really impacting downstream. And they found that a lot of it is actually due to climate change. Even if all those reservoirs were released downstream, it wouldn't, um, it wouldn't replace the missing water. Um, but it can help a lot, especially when we have, when it's very low in the wet season, for instance, mm -hmm. when it's not supposed to be low, um, if China is willing to release. And I think, in the last few years, China has shown willingness to work with lower Mekong nations. And, um, you know, ideally it's not down to the largest of a single country, but it's a, it's a great sign if China's willing to do this. And if countries can kind of work collaboratively with China, that, that could certainly help. And then with all that sun, why not solar panels? <laughs> well, yeah, I mean, that's the thing. We're very, uh, the cost of solar has dropped dramatically in the last few years. And so like, you know, Cambodia has a moratorium on main stem dams, which is great. They've what had, kind of dams? So there's the main stem, which are in the main stem of the Mekong as okay. opposed to the tributaries. Um, but they haven't done that for tributaries, which is much more important for Cambodia's uh, sake. Um, we would hope, though, if the cost of solar really just keeps plummeting, that, you know, the government, any government would, would start turning to that. But we have to remember like a lot of times it's not necessarily about the cost benefit but it's about somebody making money off of something yeah, um, yeah. 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 i'm sure you all know <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I think the audience sort of understands that yeah. yeah so i've read the book what should i take away from it um what should you take away from that uh, i wrote this book I mean, it's not, it's not an activism book. I'm not, it's not a call to action. A lot of people say like, what should I do? And I don't have an answer. Um, I really was just trying to look at a place um, to capture the place in that moment and to, and to talk about how, you know, these forces are swirling around it and changing it. Um, so I hope you just, I don't know, I hope you take away like, that it wasn't a waste of a few hours. <laughs> no, 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 no. On the contrary. Um, you know, my sense was that, you know, you've you've captured very much that just exactly what you said. you you wanted to capture it right there. And now we know what, what's going on. And um I just think it 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 prompts me to think not just about different Cambodia, but also about the environment. Mm -hmm. And I do hope it becomes part. I, I hope you get the readers who deserve, that's for sure. Mm -hmm. And I, you know, and I hope it's seen as not just a Cambodia book, but an environmental book. You know, you know climate emergency, everybody can do it. Anyway, so I think it's time for questions. What do you okay. think? Yeah. I'll start with one. Okay. Um, so in the process of writing this book uh, and researching and investigating, what are some of the, the really standout people or experiences or institutions that you encountered that helped form this sense of place mm -hmm. for troubling the water? Yeah, um, so one of, you know, even though I didn't get to go back the way I wanted to, I, I did get to go back a few times, which was great, and then see a, a few people over a period of time. Um, and there's this one woman I write about, Cheng Long, and she's, she was this very old woman who lived in Pactol, which is this riverside community. Um, and she was just, I don't know, she was a gun. She was like, she had kind of been through everything. She was a Khmer Rouge survivor. She'd lost most of her children. She remarried, she moved to the water. She, she'd never spent time on the water before. You know, she talks about like, I'm still nervous being on boats, but she really like um, just pushed forward with her life and, um, what really struck me was she had this, she had this garden right there alongside the riverbank. And she, I think the first time I visited her, the forest fires, had, we had gone because of the forest fires. We wanted to see that situation. And there was still sort of smoking in the distance and she was already replanting all of her plants. And she was just kind of like, you, you gotta just pick yourself up and move on. Um, so she, she was, yeah, I think she was really indicative of a lot of these 
people who are just making the best of a very bad situation where so much is not in their control and they're just um, they're just doing what they can to get by as well as they can. Do you have plans to translate the book to Hekmai? I would love that. Like yeah, I mean, that would be phenomenal. Um, I don't really know. I don't know how to do that. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I should, yeah, I should speak to some local publishing houses because that would that would absolutely be my hope. Um, you know, there's all these really great Khmer language bookstores popping up in Phnom Penh now. And, um, I've had so much interest from Cambodian leaders, which is really nice. And for some reason, I don't think the bookstores that are carrying it, which is very frustrating. And I'm just sending PDFs to anyone who <laughs> asks for it. Um, if you're in Cambodia and you want a copy, please just message me. I'm sorry, Shady. I know I'm supposed to say buy, buy it at Lost City Books, but sure that, I, I will send you a PDF. Um, yeah, it would be fantastic if it would be translated. Are you offering your services? I don't know how to translate it. Oh, okay. Cool. Cool. Yes. Hi. You mentioned um, oh. USAID has a program um, to help with the water, but has China or any of these other um, countries that do development projects in Cambodia done similar things? That's a good question. I don't know if China has done, like, China has. You know, most of China's projects are infrastructure focused. Um, I haven't heard of any uh, kind of humanitarian aid development project like that. Um, it doesn't mean it's not out there. I would have to look it up and get back to you, but I have not, I haven't heard of that. And it doesn't, it doesn't seem like it's kind of in their wheelhouse from my understanding of Chinese aid, but yeah. Do you have a sense of the like how aware the society is of this problem, or is there a major divide between rural and urban? You know, as I imagine, Phnom Penh's population is growing, it's expanding. Do people in town really know that this is happening to their fellow Cambodians? Um, that's a good question. I mean, it is. I think it is really well covered by local media, as far as I can tell. Um, you know, there's there's just like constant stories about. Oh, this is a situation on the Tonle Sap this year. The fishers are saying this. Um, but, you know, in terms of does someone in Phnom Penh, are they aware that the river is being choked off to this degree? I don't know. Um, you know, I, like there's a there's a real issue at the moment because they're they're going off environmental defenders really hard in Cambodia. There's been quite a lot of these young activists, specifically environmental activists who have been arrested in, in recent years. Um, and so I think on the one hand, young people are really hyper aware of these environmental issues. And this has become like quite popular for people who follow social media. Um, but I don't know if this issue in particular is kind of the, the one at the moment um, that, yeah, it's a good question. Um, you mentioned the, the Mekong River Commission a couple of times mm -hmm. with the reports, but um, does the commission, does the commission kind of play any role or can it play any role with, with the lake? Uh, it seems, it seems like a kind of a relic of a different time in terms of international cooperation. Um, you know, at the moment, I guess people are, a lot of us are probably thinking about how small countries can not be, you know, overrun by big countries. Mm. Uh, but, you, and obviously the lake is part of the bigger problem, or the, the, the broader problems involving the lake are. Mm. I wonder if Vietnam, as a growing power, you know, will have more of a role. But yeah, I'm kind of interested in that, that middle uh, scale that you mm. mentioned about, about regional, um, the regional size. Do you see any hope for like corporations to actually solve these problems? I don't know. I mean, you look at ASEAN and they're not really together as a group. Like I, you know, you would hope because this is such a shared resource as opposed to ASEAN where, you know, just everybody has their own. Like this is a really shared resource, but at the same time, so the MRC, for those who don't know, it's the Mekong River Commission. It's kind of like the, an intergovernmental body that 
is supposed to, it's not a governing body and it's, none of its decisions are binding. And as a result, you know, they can say there should not be any dams built on the lower Mekong main stem, but then Lao will kind of be like, I don't really care what you have to say and go ahead and build it. And there's no repercussions for that. Um, you know, the, the ones who are really impacted, Vietnam and Cambodia, Vietnam in particular, because it's at the bottom of the line, it's not, it's not building, you know, dams for the most part. Um, and it's because of the dams, its delta is getting totally messed up. Um, yeah, maybe as Vietnam becomes more powerful, it, it will have a better role to play, but these are governments with such different you know, you have Thailand, like each of these governments just has such a different MO and, and they've sort of historically just been so unable to work together. Um, Sorry, that wasn't a... <laughs> it wasn't a <laughs> but it's not impossible. I But it, unfortunately, I personally feel a lot of it will just come down to China's largesse. I mean, that's sort of how it seems. I had a data question. Do we have any quantity of like how many people are abandoning this lifestyle of being fishermen? Like how many people are being pushed into starvation or below mm -hmm. the two dollar a day? Do we, what, what's what 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 can we quantify the effect? Um, that's a great question. No, there's really data is really bad. It's hard to even figure out exact. I mean, I think I use the figure of two million people directly depend on the lake, but even that is like, you know. The, the census does not break it down to that degree. You have various like NGOs that have kind of tried to codify it, but there's not, it would be really important and interesting to know that. Um, part of the thing that you would see is um, people are going to, into huge amounts of debt and people's kids are migrating for work. So I don't even know if the data would tell the whole picture because maybe they're managing to stay up the poverty line but at a huge personal cost or right? they've lost you know their homes and yeah yeah it's very anecdotal unfortunately i would just like to ask i have a lot of data and policy questions i could ask you and i'll save them for the next okay. time even so policy more conversation with you but what was the most surprising thing that you learned when you were doing your research and engagement for this story? Um, well, this is I, something I really loved is that um, I just started finding all these historical texts where uh, any kind of anyone who was like a historical visitor to Cambodia writes about the lake, and it's because it's so extraordinary, and you can you can like feel that jumping off the page. They describe what it was like. You know, and I'm talking about Chinese emissaries in the 13th century or like French colonialists in the 18th century. And like every single person who sort of describes like their boat approaching this vast sea and, and the creatures of the deep that they've never seen. And these, you know, it's like mythical the way they're talking about these fish. Um, so the, those were really delightful to come across. Um, there's also this Cambodian zoo archaeologist who was looking at these four or five, 6,000 year old, like archeological sites right by the lake. And he found, he found these remains of these fish that were so huge that like, there had to be so, like special fishing tools to catch them that don't even exist anymore. Like how somebody 4,000 years ago caught, you know, a fish <laughs> this big. So that sort of stuff was really neat. Can I ask, it struck me when you were talking about the woman who had survived the Khmer Rouge and then suddenly found herself on the lake and then every, everything burnt. I mean, the history of the Cambodian people mm -hmm. is just so wrenching. In your discussions with people, because they've had to overcome so much, this must seem like a problem that's, you know, for tomorrow when they're trying to deal with the here and now or their brutal history. How much activism or, or proactive um, worry or concern did you find among the Khmer themselves? Oh, I mean, all the Cambodian fishermen I was talking to were very concerned and they were, they were really, um, you know, they're, they're seeing this firsthand and um, they were also hyper aware of the problem. They would say like, what should be done? And they'd say there should be enforcement. Like the, the 
fisheries officials are not going after the right people, or they'd say like the the dams in Laos and China, those are what's keeping them back. So so people are um, kind of hyper aware of the problem because it's affecting them so personally, um, as well as the cause. Uh, you know, from again from a government standpoint, it just doesn't feel like that's happening. But yeah. You have um, wonderful photographs in it. Oh, yeah. Could you tell me about? Yeah, I should give a shout out to the photographer, Nicholas Axelrod, who um, really kindly gave me these photos for free. I'm. It's really a pity because I don't think the publisher did these justice. They're gorgeous photos. Um, I would recommend looking them up online in and color. You, and he's with a, a, a dive fishery. So this is this is Trey Real, the tiny fish that becomes for hawk. I mean, it's just um, wonderful. Those but yeah, so Nick, it was Nick's idea to go to the lake in the first place to check out the drought. So I'm, mm -hmm. I really owe him a debt of gratitude. And he's with a, a photo cooperative? or Yeah, it's a small cooperative called Room. It's based in Southeast Asia. Yeah. Yeah. It's they just lovely. Work. Yeah. It really is lovely. Thank you for giving me a chance to, <laughs> <laughs> I should have, I should have done no, that. No, no, no. I mean, it's, it's, it's just really helps yeah. the book. And you, you have a new book out, right? Yes. <laughs> 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 Abby, actually liked it, which makes me happy. Um, you don't belong here. Um, how three women rewrote the story of war. It's three women war correspondents from Vietnam era. Um, Kate Webb, Australian. Catherine Lacroix, the photographer from France, and Frances Fitzgerald, America. So it's a remarkable book. I really like each other. Uh, if you have the power in the world, mm -hmm. uh, what would you do to stop from this thing not happening? Like, uh, like if I could wave my magic wand. Yes. Um, I guess the, oh, I don't want to say get rid of hydropower completely because I, people are depending on this electricity. Um, but uh, okay, I'm waving my magic wand and saying all these nations are cooperating really well so that the the water is being released when it's needed. Um, there's also, there's global cooperation. So there's like real efforts to stop climate change. And then the third one is like, there's a huge anti-corruption drive in Cambodia. And <laughs> you know, that's the big one. I don't know if number one is the, well, in terms of the hydrology, like maybe, uh local i mean I, I i don't think i don't know if we can totally save how the lake pulse works and everything but i do think we could a lot could be done to mitigate the impact on the, the fisher families um a lot could be done to like give them alternative locations tons could be done to protect the fisheries uh you know that's not impossible um, even if the water is not moving the way it used to. Yeah. But theoretically, there, there is a way in which the upstream countries could release it in a way that preserves the hydrology. Is that, is that at least theoretically possible? I don't think so. Okay. I think kind of the hydrology has changed so much. Is that right, Courtney? Yeah, so I, I work on, on this <laughs> issue that we've, we've engaged a lot before. It's, it's hypothetically possible. It's okay. really not realistic, though, okay. because the dams are in place and there's a certain amount of sort of dead stored water that can't be released until the dams are not there anymore. What would be possible is greater collaboration, as Abby said, in coordinating on when water is being released, because dams usually hold back water during the dry season during the wet season and release it during the dry season, which is the opposite of that flood pulse system that Abby was talking about. So if there could be efforts to coordinate things, especially during drought years when the impacts of low water are felt most strongly by collaboration, it's possible, but that political will needs to be there. Thank you so much. That was <laughs> much better than my uh, rambling. So in, in the Northwest, Yes. Dams are being taken down. They are, yeah. In a lot of the US, there's is decommissioning of dams, which is a huge undertaking because you know the the 
everything upstream got flooded. So those used to be towns and villages, everything downstream, you've built all these things around a river that if you get rid of the dam, all of that will be flooded. So it's it's a massive undertaking. It's not, but it's, it's environmentally, it's yeah. a big success. Yeah. Fish are, the fish are very happy. Mm -hmm. The salmon are so yeah. pleased. Yeah, and dams are not, they're not really commonly created here in the U.S. anymore. Well, and that goes back to the one thing about development. Mm -hmm. You know what's what? Where is that country on the development cycle, yeah. and where does it match the technology? Yeah. And can you just like what? Let's surprise. What was wonderful is how Southeast Asia they didn't have telephone poles; they immediately went into um, cell phones, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. And is it possible to avoid the whole dam yeah, stage leapfrog and leapfrog into yeah. um, into solar? Yeah, I mean, there's a lot of there's a lot that's been done with solar. There's these whole floating solar barges now. Really? Yeah. Um, Where are the, they? They're they're being trialed in, in, the, in parts of Southeast Asia. Oh, really? I where exactly? Um, the cost of solar is dropping immensely. The cost of batteries is dropping immensely. Oh. So all of these things really do give viable alternatives. Um, you know, we, we don't want to go back to coal. We're not saying that. That's, <laughs> but <laughs> no one accused you. <laughs> I'm actually working for the coal lobby. So. <laughs> <laughs> you're here to sell. For... You're here to sell um, Russian gas and oil. Yes. <laughs> Do you have time for more questions? Or... Um, I can give the closing question. Okay. Here. okay. Um, and this one is for you, Elizabeth. As a person who has worked um, on on the subject of Cambodia for so much of your career. Um, as you were reading this book, what are some, some striking facts or moments that leapt out at you and sort of tickled your, your insights that you think the reader should leave with? Well, well what I, I, I totally admired was what I said earlier is that I knew X and I knew Y and I'd been there and I'd been here. She made a full picture. And um, that's so important that um, I saw how it worked together. That's where corruption, greed, and cronyism comes. That's where um, <clears throat> the Cambodian version of the oligarchs are. Um, and then, to, and as I said, to live it. So that's why the rice needs to grow. And, and just, it told me a total picture. And that I did not have at all on the Tonle Sap. I had a, a, the romantic version. It's so beautiful. Mm -hmm. And um, there's, there's so many myths about the changing the white princess who comes and takes it. And, mm -hmm. um, and um, no, it just, she brought it together for me and she, she did it in, um, at the humane level, the human level, the geographical, political level, the, and the larger environmental level. So that's, that was very important for me. It was not comfortable. But that's okay. That's okay. Some of the best works, I think, can be uncomfortable. <laughs> um, as you said, the, the, the excerpt that you read earlier was deeply sad, but so laden with truth. So um, I appreciate you so much. Thank you both for speaking tonight. This has been an, an amazing conversation. We can ignore the yelling man outside. <laughs> <laughs>